Good morning. If you've got your Bibles with you, please open them up to Jeremiah 23. We'll be reading 1 to 6. That's Jeremiah 23, 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pastors, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In this day, Judah, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous saviour. Thank you. Good morning again. I trust that as we've been racing through our series on the... Uh, brief overview of the Old Testament that you've begun to appreciate or appreciating more the progressive revelation of God to us through the Old Testament. From creation, the giving of the law, the rescue of the people caught in slavery, the development of a nation, through to the prophets calling the people back to God, God has progressively been revealing more and more of himself, more of his character, more of his heart for his people. And he's always calling them to be a blessing to the surrounding nations. And by the way, the, the world was quite heavily populated in Jesus' day. There were people settled all around the world in Africa, Europe, China, the Americas, Australia, Asia. There were people settled all over the world in Jesus' day. But in terms of God's revelation of himself, the centre of the world was Israel. And the, the rest of the world had no idea what God was up to until the church was born. But God's progressive revelation of himself was about to culminate in Jesus, his gift to the world. Prior to his coming, the prophets were summoned to call the people back to God. And for some of them, they had the privilege of prophesying Jesus' coming. And Jeremiah was one of these fellows. He writes in the early days of Isaiah and the book closes with the fall of Jerusalem, the exile of the people to Babylon. The city falls, it is destroyed. Second Kings 24 tells us that there were up to somewhere in the vicinity of 10,000 people who were taken into exile into Babylon from the city of Jerusalem. And God had appealed to them time and time and time again to the various kings, to the people, through Jeremiah and other prophets. And he repeatedly called the people to, and the king to come back to himself. But they wouldn't listen. In chapter 22 of Jeremiah, the previous chapter to our reading today, Jeremiah brings words of judgment upon Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim is the third king of Judah during Jeremiah's days of prophecy. His heart and his eyes, 
God says in uh, chapter 22, are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood and on oppression and extortion. He's not a particularly nice fellow. He's dishonest, bloodthirsty, corrupt. God therefore says, I will hand you over into the hands of those who want to kill you. That would be good news, wouldn't it? I want to hand you over to those who want to kill you, those you fear, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Babylonians. I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born, and there you will both die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. That would be good news, wouldn't it? Fancy being told that. God treats sin seriously. And perhaps even more so, the ones who are placed in positions of authority. The king was meant to be God's representative and lead the people toward God, to God, to lead them in God's ways. But as shepherds of the nation, many of the kings had failed to do that. There were a few uh, exceptions. Josiah was one. But as I consider the situation for Jehoiakim and his mum, when they were exiled into Babylon, how did mum feel? Was she disappointed with her son? Was she angry with her son? Did she feel or fear what might happen next? Did she lay the blame for her demise at his feet or did she blame God? Laying the blame has always been the first reaction when we're upset at the fall. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent. Neither are prepared to accept responsibility, neither are prepared to bow in humility before an all-powerful creator God, a holy God. Now as we watch our world going down the proverbial tubes, as we have watched the culture of our nation change from biblically based to secular, as we have seen marriage redefined, as we see a stronger push toward abortion and euthanasia, as we're taken to a place where we don't want to be, we're often also driven by fear and anger. And often our reactions and responses are anything but motivated by gentleness and respect, as Peter calls us to. In a place where we don't want to be, we want to blame somebody. And so we too often blame our shepherds. We blame our leaders. Now, although Jehoiakim was young, he had been warned about failing to honour God. Thus, chapter 23, verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. They're doing anything but what they're meant to. He says, because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil that you have done, declares the Lord. Jehoiakim was only 18 when he became king. And so being of a younger age is no excuse for not taking God seriously for not taking our responsibility before God seriously. We are responsible for ourselves. There's no point in blaming the system, blaming your parents, blaming a tragedy in your life. We are responsible for ourselves. And so for Jehoiakim, for pursuing evil, for being set only on dishonest gain, shedding innocent blood, 
on oppression and extortion. Jehoiakim will suffer the consequences, not just for Jehoiakim's sake, but so that others may see the value of God's correction. And as you read these verses, you may think that God somehow takes pleasure in bestowing punishment. I don't think so. His heart is filled with compassion. This is why he appeals time and time and time again to the people to turn back to him. He's withholding judgment. And I'm sure that he grieves for us when we ignore him and his ways, thinking that we somehow know better than he. And when the hammer finally falls, his heart remains such that we might return to him and bask in his blessings. An abundant life filled with peace and joy and love and security is what he wants for us. His heart is not to punish but to restore and to bring reconciliation. However, as we grow up through childhood, we tend to see correction or discipline as punishment. We therefore interpret God's intervention as punishment. But parents don't enjoy having to discipline their children. I should ask for a a raise of hands. How many parents enjoyed disciplining your child? I don't think there'd be too many. And I don't think that God takes any pleasure in it either. And so God's law and the consequences for sin are less about punishment than they are about being a deterrent for us so that we won't pursue that which is not beneficial for us but rather keep us close to him and remain in his full blessing. God still wants to bless us. You see, God's heart is still for his people. Verses 3 and 4. He says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their, their pasture where they will be fruitful, increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them. They will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. There won't be any who are missing. God says that he will not abandon his people, but he'll step in and he'll make things right. He'll firstly gather the remnant of his scattered flock in exile. He'll bring them back together, back into the promised land. Second, they shall be fruitful, they'll be multiply. Thirdly, God will raise up good shepherds, leaders over them who will care for them. Their shepherds will not be corrupt, will not be selfish or vain. They'll be genuinely caring for the people. And Nehemiah was one such shepherd. He's not a king, but he's a shepherd of the people. We'll think about him next week. A good shepherd. And the people shall no longer live in fear. They will enjoy freedom and prosperity. God is going to care for his people. God's heart is still for his people. God then declares that he will do even greater things, unthinkable things, abundantly more than they could ask or imagine. And we live in that wonderful day when, that Jeremiah wrote about. Verse 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up from the line of David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah is speaking of Jesus. And this is approximately five, six hundred years before his coming. Over and against all of the other kings in Israel's history who were sinful, self-centred, all too easily corrupt and unjust and abused their power and their authority, 
King Jesus shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In contrast to the earthly kings and shepherds, Jesus would be far greater than they were ever meant to be. He would be there. He would be our good shepherd. In fact, his name will be the Lord, our righteous saviour, the Lord, our righteousness. Our righteousness. So as we watch our world going down the tubes, before we point the finger at the failure of our shepherds, our leaders of the day, let us remember that there is none righteous, not even one. apart from Jesus. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God apart from Jesus. Paul reminds us in Romans 3 that as, as far as being righteous is concerned, as far as being legally in the right before God, not one of us has a leg to stand on. We all deserve God's judgment because of our sin. We can do our absolute best, be on our best behaviour. We can tell God that we love him and try to be faithful to him in all things, but we will never reach God's righteous standard. As Isaiah declared, our most righteous acts are but filthy rags in his sight. And so Jehoiakim was an evil king and he's exiled to Babylon and he spent 37 years in prison before he was released. He does die in Babylon after 37 years imprisoned. His was not a happy life, but Jehoiakim is listed in the genealogy of Jesus. And so eventually from the descendants of a troubled man, of a rebellious life, God does the unthinkable. God doesn't just bring good, he brings the best. Jesus, our righteousness. He is, not, he is the only one righteous and our right standing with God is obtained through faith in him. Paul goes on in Romans 3 to say this, Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God pre presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Righteousness is a gift from God received in faith. And Paul says, speaks of this amazing reconciliation that we now have with God Almighty. He says, for, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we may be made right with God through Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus allows us to be in right standing with God, declared righteous. On our behalf, the righteous one who knew no sin took the penalty for our sin. And through our faith in him, we are declared righteous before our holy God. God orchestrated the unthinkable. That sinful people like you and I may be able to come into the very presence of God, be forgiven and know eternal life. The heart of our Father is such that he made it easy. He, he made it as simple as he could for us to walk with him and remain in his full blessing. 
The progressive revelation of God's love and faithfulness was fully revealed in Christ. Again, it may be very easy for us to point the finger at our shepherds, our leaders, and seek to remove ourselves from any blame for our failings. But we now live in an age where we have, you and I have, direct access to the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have direct access to the Father through our faith in Jesus Christ. We are without excuse. We cannot and must not seek to shift the blame to anyone else but ourselves for our spiritual condition. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.18 says that through Christ we share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. God has not left us as orphans or as exiles living in a place where we don't want to be, but grants us direct access into his very throne room and for us to enjoy our relationship with him as our loving, gracious, merciful Father. Have you placed your faith in Jesus, his death and resurrection? Are you continuing to place your faith in Jesus? Have you asked for his forgiveness? Have you turned away from your sin? If you know that you're not right with God today, then I invite you to do that. Get right with him. Confess your sin. Ask for his forgiveness. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you today, then don't quench the Spirit. Come forward and we can pray with you. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we might be made right with God through Christ. If you'd like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then we'd love to pray with you too.